Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're broadcasting from the Thomas K. McKeon Center for Creativity, and I'm your host, Corey D. Taylor. My guest today is none other than Sean Copler. He is the chairman as well as the CEO of Region Bank. If you want to take an inside look at what it takes to be successful in the financial arena, you come to the right place. So stay tuned because this is Up Close with Corey Taylor. Hello and welcome back. We are here with Chairman and CEO of Regent Bank, Sean Copeland. How are you, sir? Thank you, Corey. You yeah. doing good? Yes, sir. Good man, to see you. Man, well, I'm glad that you're here, man. And I, I get super excited about having guests on the show because I believe that the guests that we select to come on the show, they really have some valuable stuff to impart to our viewers. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, I have this thing that I ask everyone when they come on the show. What is it that you've been up to? <laughs> well, you've had some great guests, first of all. <laughs> so I'm feeling a little bit of pressure. Uh, no, I, mean, no pressure. I need to bring some value today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I uh, am chairman and CEO of the bank. Right. And so my uh, day job is uh, moving the organization forward. We now have about 70 employees in three different markets. Uh, we started eight, no, nine, nine years ago, uh, really from scratch. We bought a little bank up in Nobata, Oklahoma. Okay. And it has just been the most amazing a uh, blessing of my life. You um, know, and that's 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 weird because I used to live in Coffeeville, Kansas. Yeah, yeah. I came from St. Louis, and, and so I, yeah. no water's right there. Oh yeah, we had a branch <laughs> in South Coffeeville. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That little town across wow. the border. So when you say that, you know, it's been about nine years that you've had the bank, and you said you bought a little bitty bank. Kind of take us through that process because on this show we've had everybody from celebrities to professional athletes, and you're the first banker that right. we've ever had. But I want to say this for our viewers, you're not just a banker, you're also a best-selling author. Right, so right. among other things, so tell me, what is that process of buying a bank? Well, it's really just like buying any other business. The, the interesting thing about banking is just like every business has inventory that they sell, our inventory is money. So you basically buy and sell money. So when you go buy a bank, um, it's really the same. You look at the earnings, you look at the assets, you look at the, in our, in our industry, it's very important to buy good loans. Uh, so you look at credit quality. The only big difference is you have to get a lot of regulatory approval because banks are FDIC insured, so your money is safe. Uh, the regulators have a very, um, a powerful role in the banking industry, so they had to approve me uh, to buy it. Wow, so now, I, I, what gets me is, okay, because when we think, and, and one of my books that I wrote, the um, Community State Bank that was in Coffeeville, yeah. that CEO, um, you know, did the foreword, one, one of the, the, the forewords. Yeah. Um, and, 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 but I, the thing that was so interesting is when people hear about chairman and CEO of the bank, they always go into this thing, well, these people have so, so much money because who else owns a bank? Right. So what made you get into banking? Was it something you were always in or did you just want uh, to step up one day and say, oh, I want to buy a bank? No, there is a, there's kind of a myth that uh, I must come from a family with a lot of money, you know, or that my family was in banking. And neither one of those are true. Wow. Uh, my dad has done very well, but uh, my grandfather and father were both uh, ranchers. Oh. And, and I grew up on a cow-calf uh, ranch, Hereford Cattle, down in Beggs, Oklahoma. So 251st Street South. So I really thought I would end up being a rancher, to be honest with you. And late in my college career, uh, my father and I talked and he said, I'm afraid that um, the, the ranch just will not support three families. Mm. You know, there's just only so much money to go around. So through a, a very comical story, which I can share later if you're interested, I ended up in the banking business and I, I loved it. I love numbers, but I really love people. And I'm very entrepreneurial uh, in nature. We have a number of investments outside of the bank. And so I just become very passionate about banking. Well, the way I ended up, I became a bank president very early in my early 20s. <clears throat> so I've been president of a bank now for about uh, 18, 19 years. Wow. About nine, well, I guess now it'd be about 10 years ago, a friend of mine who owned Regent Bank in Nowata, Oklahoma, uh, called me looking for a bank president. 
and uh, I knew his former president, and I said, well, I'd be happy to help you, but I, I asked him, his name was B.C. Lee, and I said, B.C., have you ever considered actually selling the bank and doing something different? Because it wasn't his passion. He really inherited the bank. He was third generation in the bank. The bank had been struggling some, and um, I just believe we should all do what we're passionate about. And he thought about it a little bit initially. He said, no, uh, he wasn't interested in that. And about two weeks later, he called me up and said, you know, I talked to my sister, and uh, and I think that this is something that we should do, and we want to sell it to you. Whoa! Well, I wasn't <laughs> planning on that at all. You go ahead broker a deal to so, sell it to somebody else. Exactly, and I wasn't even, I really was just telling, it, that right. was just kind of a general observation. I mean, it wasn't sell it to me. I was just saying, hey, you know, that is an option. You can go do something that you really enjoy. And so anyway, it was... Uh, it was a little lean uh, early. We, we went out and raised the capital, purchased the bank in April of 08, uh, went through two very difficult years. If you remember, that's when the recession, yes. really the depression was. Yeah. Um, our bank had been struggling anyway, so it was, those were probably the toughest years of my life. Uh, but then starting in about mid-2009 to now, We've grown at 40% a year. Wow. And so you, it was just one branch? It was just one branch. And well, how many? <clears throat> initially it was two. Okay. One in uh, Nowata and then one in South Coffeyville okay. that I mentioned. Right. About two years into owning the bank, we got an offer to sell the branch in South Coffeyville. And we are really a business bank. Our, our, um, our DNA is really we deal with small and mid-market businesses in the markets that we serve. And so South Coffeeville didn't really fit um, into our strategy. And so we love those people, but we decided to go ahead and sell it. We got a really good price for it. So then we went down to one <coughs> location and uh, uh, then expanded into Tulsa in August of 2008 and then expanded into Oklahoma City about four years ago. Wow. And so it's just been growing 40 percent every year. Now, with that being said, because I understand that the banking thing is good. It's do you do. Is it something you talked about the guy you wanted to buy from? He was talking about his passion. So is banking your passion? People are my passion. OK. <clears throat> now, the the regulations and the rules that go along with uh, banking can get a little tiresome. Um, what I enjoy is meeting people helping them achieve their goals, both employees and clients. Banking for me is a mechanism in which to do that. And it's a good one because, I mean, we have thousands of clients that are basically b my best friends and business partners. And, I mean, we strategize together. And, and I, really, I really, really enjoy it. Now, I'm going to ask you this question because a lot of times, and I just heard you say this, you said my friends are my investment partners and things like that. Now, that goes against what we would call conventional wisdom right. today because everyone says don't do business with your friends, with your friends especially not family members. Right. But I'm hearing you say that's a different, you know, field that, you know, different understanding. Yeah. So elaborate on that. Yes. And how does that work? Well, uh, you will find that I do a lot of things that are not of conventional wisdom. So this is just one of many. Um, but here's my belief. So the, in banking in particular, the reason that people always say don't do business with your friends is because if things don't go well, then it becomes very awkward. You know, if they can't make their payments or the loan goes into default or whatever. My belief, and this is, this is 20 years in now, so I believe it's been proven, my belief is just the opposite. My belief is that if, you, if we're doing a good job, we are working with our clients. And if there are problems, we both know there are problems. And we're trying to work through the problems together. I'm trying to help them get through the problems. I'm not the bad guy, you know, that's just coming in and taking away their business or their home or car. I am right there with them. And together, we determine that it's just not going to work. And then we determine the best way to get out of it so that it doesn't hurt them going forward. So I'm a very big believer that um, you can be and should be very close with your clients so you can serve them the best in that way. Wow. Now, this is something that's very interesting because not only are you the banker, and as mentioned earlier, you're also an author. And you've, been, you've written three books so far. Three books. And they've made it to be bestsellers. So <laughs> tell me how does the bank, and, and this is what's weird, 
they're like inspirational books. Right. Um, that's like an oxymoron. Banker, usually synonymous with greed and not inspiration. So kind of merge that for the viewer right. to understand how are, does that work. You are hurting my feelings a little bit, Corey. <laughs> but but uh, no, I understand what, exactly what you're saying. I think it's important, first of all, to note I am really uh, an entrepreneur. I just happen to end up in uh, banking. And so I, I, um, I love banking. I think there are some great bankers in town, but I do agree with you. For the most part, we are not the most inspirational uh, bunch. The way my uh, uh, author career started was uh, completely by accident. I was teaching as an adjunct professor at night at OSU Tulsa. Okay. And my students would consistently ask the same questions. You know, how do you, how do you determine what you want to do for the rest of your life? How do you get to the top of your organization? If you want to go to work somewhere, how do you get that job? You know, I mean, it was just the same thing over and over and over. And frankly, I had little kids at home and a wife at home, and I was spending hours talking to these young people. And I was like, man, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to end up single. <laughs> so I, I wrote, a, a, just really for fun, I was really into an author by the name of Tim Lencioni. And he's a, he's a business author, but he teaches in parables. And they're short, and they're fun to read. And so I thought, well, that would be kind of fun to put together my own little book and so somebody said hey you can self-publish for two or three thousand bucks and so I basically self-published an, an early book called Out of the Blocks and it basically answered all, all that gave at least my opinion of the answers you know to all these questions my students had been asking. Well, they loved it. I, I gave it I gave it to them at the beginning of the semester which I'm fairly certain I broke some rule, but I'm sorry, I wish you uh, for doing that. But um, anyway, I gave them the book. They really liked it. It ended up making its way to the president of OSU. He had a publishing connection. I sent a book over and ended up uh, getting it published through a subsidiary of Amazon.com. Oh, wow. So it did really well. They helped me market it. It became very popular with students. And pretty soon they asked me to write another book. So I was like, oh, man, I don't know if I got another <laughs> book in me. And so, so uh, the second book, which was called The Priority Promise, was about a struggle that I was having in my life. I looked uh, very successful. Uh, the bank was doing very well, but I was on a number of boards. We had made several investments in companies. The bank was growing very rapidly. And frankly, I was kind of miserable. I had said yes to everybody and everything, and I was totally um, you know, meeting myself coming and going, and I wasn't staying in touch with my family. So uh, long story short, that's, that's where that book came from, The Priority Promise. And then it did well, and they said, hey, can you write, can you write another one? <laughs> and so I wrote Let's the third going. one, which is, which is definitely my favorite, and it is pretty new. It's been out a few months, and it's called The Abundance Mentality. And it's basically, um, and it is, this is my very strong belief, that if in our lives we will give, if we will focus on how to help others, not take, not sell you something, not see what if I can get in your pocket, but just get to know you, you know, as a person and determine how I can help you, then all of a sudden your network grows substantially and you begin to achieve abundance without even trying. And so that is kind of what that that's kind of where the third book came in. And they've all done really well, led to speaking engagements all over the country. I read that. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, all and so, over the country. And, and I, and I want to say this because, and I know you, I'm, it's, it's just so weird. And I understand you're an entrepreneur, but you're a banker. It seems like you're definitely an out of the box person because I know you do those events and I've had an opportunity to see you at several of these events. And you know, when you're at an event, you're at an event right. like and so when it when I hear that, I remember when someone was telling me about networking years ago, they said when you are networking with people, they said networking is not what people think. It's not just coming to get a connection. Right. It's coming to make a lasting relationship. They said, if you go in with I just need this connection for now, then that's use. And right. they like and that's not really what networking is about. Right. It's about expanding your base, <clears throat> meeting new people. So at some of your events, no, at all your events, you all emphasize making good connections yes. and things of that nature. But the thing that gets me is that when you think about people, 
in money management, money stewardship roles, if you will, it's always everybody has this bad taste in their mouth. Like this person ain't gonna loan me money. These people are jerks, this. And here it is, and I've been watching you now for some years, right. and you don't have that personality. Where does that come from? Because by all means, you could be a very greedy person, but I'm hearing you say, give your third book is about if you give right <laughs> you'll get something right. without even trying so where does that come from well uh, it's spiritual to be honest okay. with you it's okay. it's it's based in my uh, faith and the fact that i've been given um you know much much more both spiritually and financially and physically than i would have ever imagined but it also comes from starting with nothing you know, I mean, when when Angela and I graduated from college, I mean, we started with nothing. And so, you know, we've had bosses and we've worked our way up, if you will, in an organization. And so I just believe that I have a greater um, appreciation for all levels of people. You know, I mean, I don't see more value in the CEO than I do the, the janitor. I mean, they're all people of value and we just all have different roles. And so I, I, think, I think that's why. It's just, it's my nature and I just feel good when I, when I can, you know, and you're this way, so you can appreciate this. When we can help someone, what's better than that? Exactly, you know? I, mean, I there, agree. There just isn't anything better. And so what I've found is over the years, the more you do that, it's just wonderful because it's more relationships, it's more connections, it's more, it's more happiness um, in my life. And that's really, that's really what it's about to me. It's not about being greedy and getting the last dollar and how can I take advantage of you. That's not what life is and, about. And, I, and do you get a lot of speaking engagements to talk to people that are on that perceived level that you're in to hear this different train of thought, this different wisdom? Yes. Yes, my, my speaking engagements typically take one of two paths. Uh, one is uh, universities, where I do quite a bit of speaking, primarily because of the earliest uh, book. The other one is typically to business leaders. And, and this is a very different um, thought process for many. It, it, there is a, we, most of us, and, and, and I hope if your viewers don't take anything out of this interview, they will take this. Most of us live in a scarcity mentality. Every day we get up and we don't have enough money and we're afraid we're going to get fired from our job and our relationship's going to end and, you know, such and such doesn't like me and there's just not enough. There is enough. There is enough. It, it is scriptural, but it is also factual that there is, there, there is an entire world out there for us. So if we can just get past that thinking of, you know, I, I remember, and it, where, it really, where this really turned for me was at a lunch, ironically, with another banker. And another visionary uh, here in town by the name of uh, Tom Bennett. And Tom and I were at lunch. This was probably 11 years ago, 12 years ago. And I was lamenting the competition. Oh, my gosh, Tom, I said, how are we going to make it? I said, there are like 50 banks, you know, in the market. Tulsa's not growing. We got regulation being heaped on us left and right. What are we going to do? I'm just wringing my hands. And he mm -hmm. just said, he said, he said, Sean, he said, you are thinking about this all wrong. And he shared the concept of abundance mentality. He said, I never think about competition. I don't think about competition. I focus on, on, you know, my goal for the day and achieving what I want to do and helping the people I can help and everything else takes care of itself. Immediately after that, this was confirmed for me in the seven habits of highly effective people and in a Bible study I was in because it's all throughout the New Testament. And so if we can just um, get this into our uh, into our DNA and into our spirit, I think it can make a huge difference in people's lives. Now take me back, because you, when your dad had that conversation with you at the ranch and said, I don't think the ranch can support three families, what was that feeling like oh, back gosh. then? Because that's the family business. That's granddad, that's dad, right. and I'm about to do it, then there's no room at the end. Right. What was that like? That's exactly right. Well, it was extremely scary, and I had one semester left of college. So this was the spring semester. I was going to graduate in the fall, 
and we were working cattle when he informed me uh, of, of uh, my newfound uh, need for employment. So I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Well, here's the crazy story. So I leave there, and I, and I go back to college. And I had been in student leadership at uh, Oklahoma State University. And the president at the time was a gentleman named Jim Halligan. And he invi- would always invite uh, student leaders to attend the big people functions, the adult, you know, the big right, stuff. Right, right. Well, he'd invited me to attend this uh, Board of Regents dinner mm-hmm. on Tuesday. This, so on Sunday, I find out I don't know what I'm going to do. On Tuesday, we have this Board of Regents dinner. So we go in there and we sit down. And I'm super nervous, and I'm kind of quiet through the whole deal. And we got kind of to the end of dinner, and Dr. Halligan says, so, Sean, you know, I've always wanted to ask you this. What are you going to do when you graduate? <laughs> and I thought, oh, man, I don't, I don't know. Not what I'm No, I'm not, not, not going to be farming and ranching. <laughs> so I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, but I was like, I got to come up with an answer because I don't here I'm, a, you know, Mr. OSU. Surely I know what I'm going to do by my <laughs> senior year. Right. So this is a true story. I, I look down to my left, like right where you're sitting. I'm sitting here, and I look down there, and in the nameplate in front of this man, it says, Bruce Benbrook, Chairman, Stock Exchange Bank, Woodward, Oklahoma. And I thought, well, that sounds that sounds like a good answer. <laughs> so I said, true story. I said, I said, you know, I said, actually, I've been thinking about going into banking. I announced this to the whole town. I've been thinking about going into banking. And they all go, no way. We didn't know that. And I said, oh, yeah. I said, it's very recent, <laughs> very, very recent career decision. It was it was 10 seconds old. So they start asking me all these questions about banking. Well, I don't know anything about banking. I mean, they're what position? Well, Loan officer, that's all I can think of. What kind of bank? Well, small community bank. I'm just making stuff up. And Dr. Halligan, as we're walking out of this event, totally changed my whole life when he said, you know, Sean, I really didn't know you were going into banking. I've got a good friend who owns a group of banks in Oklahoma City. Maybe I can help you get an internship this summer. Wow. So I go, I would love that. I mean, I was desperate for a job, you know. (laughs) Banks are air conditioned. The Copeland Farm is not. So I was like, I would be super interested. So I run back to my uh, room and I delete out my old objective, put financial services professional, play up a little bit of finance classes that I had, run it back over, run the resume to his office. And sure enough, I get an internship at MidFirst Bank. And so this and I want our viewers to no doubt hear this. So here it is. You go from devastation Pretty much, you're not going to be in a family business. Love you, but not enough room right, for you. Right. Then you're put in a situation where you have to come up with an answer real quick. You're sitting there, you see a name tag, and now that's what I'm going to do. And then now you're having to, you know. And so I know all of this time was scary while you were going through and saying all yes, of this. But yeah. it was almost like you had like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right, yes. You know, so yes. what was that like? I mean, what is that like now that you sit back and now you're telling this story and now you're you're owning the bank when out of your mouth you I don't have a clue as to what I'm going to do. But this is what I'm doing. And now 20 years later, you own the bank. Yeah, it's, it's wild. In that moment when when this all happened, it's one of those surreal moments of your life where I remember when I was answering the question, all these things came into my mind like like this. I thought, um. A, that, that sounded like a noble profession. <laughs> B, I remembered my grandfather saying, now, Sean, if you ever move into a new town, you need to get to know the local banker because they're more likely to loan you money if they know you correct. than if they don't. And that is correct. Yes. That is completely illogical. Learned that in Coffeeville. It, yes, true. It is not like you're less risky just because I know you, but uh, you feel less risky to me because I can come find you, I guess. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know why, but yeah, we do. Uh, we do that, it, you know, and then in addition, I thought, well, you know, it was it would be neat to be the place where people um, wanted to wanted to come to. You know, I mean, there are a lot of industries where people are out trying to sell products that people don't really want. Well, everybody wants money, you know. Right. And so I thought, well, that would be kind of neat. And so so in that moment, my whole life changes. And and I believe that the real story 
in that moment is what the president of OSU, Jim Halligan, did for me. Because if you, if you think about this, you know, we're entrepreneurs, business owners, authors, you're very busy. You know, he was very busy. I mean, he had a huge job. So he had all these things that he needed to uh, do, but he stopped and helped me and therefore changed my life. And so, you know, back to your earlier question, I think a big part of why I am the way that I am is because someone helped me. You know, I mean, if he hadn't reached down and, and helped me get that internship, you know, I don't know what I would be doing today. Wow. And so I want to do that for other people. And so I get uh, critiqued. My executive coaches and my board will always uh, critique me for uh, spending my time maybe not in the most profitable way. You know, somebody, somebody calls in and they need some advice or they're struggling or they're hurting or they need a mentor or whatever. I will take those meetings because okay. I remember what it was like to be that young man and you just needed a hand up. And you know what, that's so, that's that, and I like, I'm loving that you said it because now we're in a climate and I don't want to stay on this too long because that's going down a political lane and I don't really go there, but you know, giving somebody a helping hand you know, a hand up instead of just giving a hand out. Right. It's a totally different mentality. And that's what I'm hearing you say that no matter, I mean, I understand that you're hurting. I will take a call. I will listen, you know, and if I can help and be of service, but no means am I there to try to cripple you. Right. I'm there to help you to get to the right. next level. Yeah. And yeah. I can hear that through your books and everything. So this show up close with Corey Taylor is all about helping people to understand what it would take for them to go and be successful sure. in about 15 seconds share your ideal of what you see it takes for a person to be successful well first and foremost I think you need to know yourself I think you have to understand your strengths you have to understand what the things that you love um, so I think it's very important to move toward your strengths um, I think the second uh, key advice that I would share is uh, you got to persevere I mean, you got to never give up. Back in February of '09, we were our bank looked like it was certainly not going to survive. I mean, we had gone through very, very difficult times. We did not give up, and now we win every reward known to mankind. You wow. know, and so you just you have to find that dream and never, ever, uh, you just can't give up. Sean Copeland, thank you so much thank for you your time. Appreciate sir. it. So appreciate much. it. Yes, sir. I hope you've enjoyed our show today. I would like to thank our guest, Sean Copeland, for joining us. Think about this. Change is inevitable, but your attitude towards that change, it is always optional. Until next time, keep looking forward.